I am delighted to be here. I really am. I, I joke all the time. I see most of you guys down in the gym and, uh, in the Smith Fieldhouse and know you better than I know most of you know, my own colleagues in my own department, actually. And like Tim said, you, we've seen each other in all kinds of places, in all kinds of ways, down in the locker room. So we're, we're, we're bosom buddies. Uh, I am glad to be here. And I want to thank you guys for the work that you guys do to keep the campus running. You really are unsung heroes, and I very much appreciate that because I use, I use the facilities often. All right, my area of expertise is, in a, in a general way, it's metabolism. I study metabolic function, and over the years that has um, led me more and more to studying one particular hormone called insulin. And my hope is to impress upon you the relevance of insulin, this little hormone, and how it is driving most of the illnesses that you either have already or you're afraid of, just like me. So, the story actually starts a long time ago. And 1977 was actually a really good year in which to be born, but it was a terrible year for the first time, to my knowledge, in the history of the world, a government decided to tell its citizens what to eat. And of course they got it wrong. But nevertheless, uh, let's not jump, I don't want to jump ahead. So this senator um, headed this committee that came out with what became the Food Guide Pyramid that we're all familiar with. The gist of it was start eating a lot more carbohydrate and start eating less fat, especially saturated fat. And that really became the war on fat that persists to this day. What I want you to know, though, at the time, this was not, I'm going to just turn this off. Can you guys hear me okay at the back still if I just turn this off? Okay. Yeah, like I said, I can project really well. So, this was not without some fight. The most prominent scientists in the U.S. at the time were some of the most vocal opponents, including the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Handler. His direct quote with regard to these dietary guidelines was essentially, we don't have enough data to say what you're saying. Let's wait, because you're about to just conduct a massive experiment. Because we don't know what's going to happen if you tell people to start eating less fat and tell them to start eating more carbohydrate. But the senator, the, the, the politician, didn't care. This is his exact response to the sentiment. Basically, I have to get reelected, so tough luck. I need to have some evidence of some productivity. So here we go. And, and it worked. We started eating more carbohydrate than we ever had before, as far as we know, and less fat, as far as we know, than we ever had before. Now, so the, the politician beat the scientist. What does this have to do with my specific area of research? Well, I'll make it clear. Insulin resistance is the single most common disorder in the world. In the United States and throughout the most populous countries in Asia or the world, China and India, over half of all adults are insulin resistant, also known as pre-diabetic. So statistically speaking, over half of us, 65% of us here in this room in the United States are insulin resistant, pre-diabetic. Uh, and it's only going to get worse. And in fact, it's getting worse globally. Just last year alone, this is where I gave talks. A couple talks in the US, Korea, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, India, and Oman, Jordan, and uh, Kuwait. Um, in fact, in the Middle East, the nine most diabetic countries on the planet are in the Middle East. And number 10 is Mexico, actually. So we're not even in the top 10. So we're doing, we're doing OK. Uh, but again, over half of us are insulin resistant. Now, so what? Why, should, why have I devoted my career um, to speaking about this one disorder that many of you might not even have heard of. It's because when it's all said and done, all of these chronic disorders that terrify all of us are offshoots of insulin resistance. Where insulin resistance is either directly causing it or it's making it worse. For example, directly causing polycystic ovarian syndrome. Have you guys ever heard of that? The most common form of female infertility at its core or I should say at the ovary, that is a disease of insulin resistance, preventing the ovaries and making the correct ratio of sex hormones. Um, uh, cancer, I'm gonna talk about cancer. Cancer is not caused by insulin resistance, it <coughs> makes it a lot worse. So if you look at this, what I like to call the wheel of misfortune, 
I'm Pat Sajak here. I'm um, Pat Sajak's evil twin. Much less handsome, but much more eloquent. Uh, here we go. This is my game show, The Wheel of Misfortune. So I mentioned a moment ago, over half of us have this disorder. Look at this little quiz. Just look through it for a second. I won't read it for the sake of time, because I want to have time for questions. If you are answering yes to two or more of these, in fact, in some instances, maybe one, like this one down here, if you have skin tags or dark patches of skin, this is most commonly seen around a skin fold at the neck if a person has a skin fold around their neck. It can also be the armpits, it can be the legs, it can be a skin fold in the belly. If you have that, boom, slam dunk, you're insulin resistant. All right, so if you answer yes to two or more, then you fit into that 65%. Now, I've been talking about this villain, insulin resistance, but I also want you to know who it is, right? I'm, I'm, telling, you, I'm telling you a story, and this is the villain in the story, so let me introduce you to the villain. Let's look at it. I want you to look at it how I do as a scientist, which is we will take a cell, and this is a cell right here. It can be a muscle cell, a brain cell, a liver cell, uh, whatever, any cell in the body, because every cell in the body, from top to bottom, responds to insulin. So every cell has these little doors, what we call an insulin receptor. It's essentially a door that only insulin can knock on. So insulin will come and knock on the door, and the cell will do something, which I'm just defining as an action. The cell will do something. If it's a muscle cell and a fat cell, it will, one of the things it does, it will tell glucose or blood sugar to come in from the blood and come into the muscle or come into the fat cell. If it's a neuron, it will help the neuron maintain its function. And the same with any other cell in the body. Over time, however, this cell becomes resistant to insulin. So insulin comes and knocks on the door. Guess what happens to the degree of action? It's diminished. This action starts to go down. Now, but the cell doesn't work if that action is diminished. So it wants to bring that action back up. So what does insulin do? What do you think? It was just politely knocking on the door. Now it's pounding on the door. And I always like to use this analogy that's like my kids. So we, the body makes a lot more insulin, and now there's pounding on the door, and now the action works. So my little son, yesterday, he came by my office. He wanted to go see the duck pond right next to the life sciences building. It started as a little gentle tug on my shirt. Dad, I want to see the duck pond. Dad, I want to see the duck pond. What, what did it turn into eventually? Dad, I want to see the duck pond! And he's freaking out. And now I respond. But I've become resistant to my little um, tyrant's voices in my family, my darling little tyrants. And I don't negotiate with terrorists, I always tell them that. But, so they just get louder. The body just gets louder. So there's two essential things I want you to remember about insulin resistance. Again, the most common of all disorders in the world. Two things. First, insulin isn't working the same way that it used to at all the cells in the body. And it can depend on the cell, but suffice it to say it's not working the same way it did before. Partly because of that not working, we also have a lot more insulin. And that's very important. So insulin resistance is two things. One, insulin isn't working, and two, the body has a lot more insulin than it did before. What we call hyperinsulinemia. Now, clinically, the, and one of the one of my favorite audiences is physicians or health practitioners, people that are actually diagnosing diseases. Because this is how they would look at the problem. Someone would come into the clinic. And they would have normal insulin and normal glucose, or blood sugar. If a person, of course, this is normal. They would just say, you're normal. You don't have diabetes or pre-diabetes. However, if a person comes in and they have higher than normal levels of insulin, but normal glucose, which is totally possible, this wouldn't even fall on, it wouldn't even be a blip on the radar of the average clinical practice. This wouldn't either, high levels of insulin, and even this wouldn't even be detected. This is insulin resistance, right here, in a snapshot. It is the body has this insulin storm just raging in the blood, and yet it's enough to keep blood glucose in control. Because one of insulin's main <coughs> actions is to push the sugar from the blood out of the blood into the cells of the body. Because if blood sugar stays too high for too long, we die. It is toxic, literally toxic and harmful, lethal to the body. We've got to get it out of the blood. Insulin will do that. So, in this case, we just need a lot more insulin to get the job done. 
that is insulin resistance. But because most clinical practices don't look at insulin, they only look at glucose, this just flies under the radar. They don't know what's going wrong. All the physician may know what's happening is all those diseases around that beautiful wheel of misfortune that I talked about earlier. The physician may say, well, you just have hypertension, or you have early stage Alzheimer's disease, or fatty liver disease, or you have PCOS. Little knowing that every single one of those disorders has one common root, insulin resistance. Now, unfortunately, eventually, the body becomes so resistant to its own insulin that now the glucose has climbed. It can't keep the blood sugar under control anymore, and now it starts to rise, and then it's clinically relevant in most instances. But of course, the tragedy is it was clinically relevant here. We just didn't catch it in time. And just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll mention this. There are studies to show this, but if you look at insulin, you can detect it well beyond 10 years before the glucose ever changes. So for you, one takeaway that I would hope is that when you go in for your next medical checkup, and they're doing the typical blood lipids and glucose, ask your physician, can you please measure my insulin? <coughs> then you'll know where you really are. All right, now what is insulin resistance? I'm going to have these cheeky little scriptures here because I've been accused of teaching against the word of wisdom in the past, but nothing I teach goes against doctrine. I'm happy to talk about that more. I'm very eager to have some time at the end for some Q&A. So, all right, insulin resistance. How do we get it? Now you know what it is. We know what the villain is. How did the villain get in in the first place? How did it get there? Obesity or too much body fat or having fat growing in an unhealthy way, and that's almost, that's beyond the scope of this lecture, but I'm happy to address that in the Q&A. Not all fat on the body is created equal. Literally, it doesn't develop on the body in a, in a good or, or bad way in all instances. Inflammation. If someone has a chronic inflammatory disorder like rheumatoid arthritis, that can drive insulin resistance. And then lastly, too much insulin itself. Remember, this big word just means too much insulin in the blood. Now, one interesting thing is if you look at these three distinct causes, they're not, in fact, so distinct. One of the biggest contributions, if I may say so, of my own research has been to find, has been to find that there is, in fact, a linearity to all of this. Too much insulin drives fat cells to grow. I'm going to prove that to you in just a little bit. And as, depending on how the fat cells are growing, I'm not going to talk about this, but we can talk about it in the Q&A. That will promote inflammation in the body, and then that will be where the rubber meets the road, and now we have insulin resistance. I will simply add one, but one thing to note, it starts with too much insulin. And another point to take from this is that what mediates this connection between fat cells growing in a bad way, and then them from these bad fat cells promoting bad inflammation in the body, it's because the fat cells become enriched with this type of fat called linoleic acid. I'll come back to that in a little bit. But it's something, it's the single most common <coughs> fat that we eat in the Western diet. Western diet, which is all over the world now, in India as well. So I, I've emphasized this a little bit. I'm just really bringing it home. Too much insulin drives insulin resistance. So as somebody is living a life that is chronically pushing their insulin up, over time, the, the body's ability to effectively respond to that insulin starts to come down. This is a fundamental biological principle. Too much of something in the body will result in a resistance to that something. Does that make sense? This, it is a fundamental biological principle. Bacteria, why do they become resistant to an antibiotic? Because they see it too much. Why does the body become resistant to a little bit of alcohol that was once enough to give someone a buzz? The body becomes resistant to that buzz from the alcohol, so they need a lot more. This is, this is true across all, uh, all biological organisms. All right, now, if too much insulin is causing the problem, how do we lower insulin? Because that's the solution, and it is. Different kinds of drugs, different kinds of diets, and different types of exercise. For the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about exercise. I will just say this. What's the best exercise to do to improve your insulin sensitivity? <coughs> the one you'll do. Whatever it is. Whatever it is, just do it. With drugs, um, I, again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to touch on that, but I kind of wish I had put that in. 
Um, there are, I, I very much have strong opinions on diabetic drugs, and if you'd like, by all means, let's talk about that at the end. I want to talk about diet, because that is the elephant in the room, the single most relevant variable here. I want to touch on two aspects. One very common one, the one that every person has engaged in at one point or another, almost, a low-fat, low-calorie diet. That is the prototypical diet for weight loss over the last 50 or so years. Watch your fat, count your calories. What a hell of a way to live. And I don't mean that in a good way. It's a miserable way to live. Counting every calorie, weighing out every little portion of food. Give me a break. It's ridiculous. There's an alternative, and I'm trying not to let my bias show too much. But there's an alternative. And I, I'll, we're going to look at the data, though. I want to kind of take you on a very, very condensed version of the journey that I went on when I went through what was a genuinely uncomfortable intellectual conversion, having long been trained and steeped in this way of thinking that it's all about counting calories to scrutinizing the calorie type. And that's what I'll get to. Now, very briefly, let's look at the evidence suggesting I'm supporting the idea of a low-fat, low-calorie. Because I, I do want to try and have some objectivity here. Um, now, here's a study. Putting people on a low-fat, plant-based diet, boy, that's common. So popular these days. So popular. In fact, some of the people that I have upset the most in my life, including the talk I gave at BYU last <coughs> July. Did some of you see that forum that I gave? Yeah, that was, I was so thrilled to give that. I really was. I was delighted, just delighted to come give that talk. Um, and it was in a way kind of validating, because um, I have not been, my sentiments have not been very well received sometimes on campus because of a perceived um, uh, conflict with the word of wisdom. And again, I'm happy to talk about that. So they put people on a low-fat, plant-based diet compared to just a conventional diet. And it had no better effect in insulin sensitivity than a conventional diet. Another study took a plant-based, a vegan diet, is that what it was, for 24 weeks, they were either on what was called a type of diabetes diet or a vegetarian diet. So it was a, con a conventional diabetic diet or a, a, a vegetarian diet. The vegetarian diet outperformed. In other words, the people adhering to the vegetarian diet over these 24 weeks had a better improvement in insulin sensitivity or their insulin resistance got better, more better, that's an awkward way to say it, than the conventional diabetic group. Now let's look at the conventional diet that the American Diabetes Association espouses, because that's what they were put on. It's a very calorie restricted diet, down to around 1,600 calories per day, which is not comfortable for many people. It's about half of all calories from carbohydrates, about 50% almost. And then it's limiting fat. Eat less fat, especially saturated fat. Saturated fat is the devil according to most people, not me, at all. Now let's look at what this diet does. This is what the vegetarian diet beat out, this diabetic diet. We have known for 30 years, in 1987, that one of the most famous diabetic scientists, which means he's not famous at all, Gerald Reven, <laughs> he put type 2 diabetics on to the letter, this diabetic diet. You know what happened? They got worse. They got worse. One of the reasons they get worse, when we tell a diabetic to eat a low-fat, higher-carbohydrate diet, we are giving them more of the very thing that is killing them. All right, here are the two main sources of fuel in the body. The body is a hybrid engine. This is another topic entirely. When I come back in a few months, Tim, I can talk about fuel use in the body, if, if I don't offend you all deeply, and I probably will. Except the guys who already know me from the locker room. We're all, I, I would have offended you years ago. So here are the two main macronutrients or fuel sources in the, in the body at any time. Which one is the diabetic or pre-diabetic insulin-resistant person struggling to control? It's the glucose, right? And so which one should we be careful with? Boy, it, 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 it's so intuitive. And so we're giving type 2 diabetics drugs that will block their ability to absorb glucose from the guts, so it makes the glucose stay in the gut. So you eat a piece of bread, which is pure glucose, and you'd give them a drug, and it would prevent the glucose from moving from the guts into the blood. So all the glucose stays in the blood, in the, sorry, in the guts, and gives them horrific diarrhea, horrific gas, socially very awkward, right? So take that very carefully. <laughs> or we give them drugs that are driving the glucose from the blood into the urine. 
So making it go into the urinary tract to be urinated out. So we're trying to block the glucose from coming in, or we're trying to push it out, giving them a greater risk of bladder cancer, a greater risk of urinary tract infections, because bacteria love glucose. It's the only fuel they can use. So you just feed all the bacteria in the urinary tract. So we're trying to block the glucose from coming in, push the glucose out. Can you see just another rational alternative? Can you see it? If we're giving them drugs to try to block the glucose in the body, just have them eat less glucose, right? Is that, I submit that's pretty, pretty intuitive, pretty darn intuitive. Now, with that, what I would submit to you, intuitive perspective in mind, I want to introduce what I consider to be three pillars to a smart strategy to control the risk of insulin resistance and diabetes and all the disorders that come with it. Three pillars. One, control carbohydrates. Two, fill with fat. Don't be afraid of dietary fat. And then lastly, make sure you get enough protein. Now, let's look. These are the three macronutrients in the diet. Macro meaning the big. These are the big parts of the food we eat, including across the table at the back, which I'm going to enjoy when I'm done. Fat, dietary fat, dietary protein, and dietary carbohydrate. Now, before I get started, what I want to impress upon you is what each of these does to insulin. I've hopefully, hopefully left with you this idea that controlling insulin is the key to controlling insulin resistance, and that means keeping insulin low as often as possible. So I want you to know what do the macronutrients do to insulin if you want to keep your insulin low. Before I say that, unless this seems overly controversial, among these three macronutrients, there are such things as essential fatty acids. In other words, fats that we must eat to survive. There are such things as essential amino acids, or parts of proteins that we must eat in order to survive. <coughs> Have you ever heard of an essential carbohydrate? Sure. You haven't. Yeah, you haven't. Even the smart aleck is not actually heard of an essential carbohydrate. There's no such thing. This isn't intended to be controversial. That is absolute fact. There is no essential carbohydrate. Now, I am not telling you not to eat them ever again. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying, why focus? Why have we? as a culture focused on the one macronutrient that we actually don't have a need for. All the glucose in our blood, we can make all we need. The liver is exceptionally good at doing that. It does it all the time. So, all right, lest that seem controversial, now you know. One of these is not like the other. Now, in, moreover, one of them isn't like the other when it comes to what it does to insulin. If you eat pure dietary fat, it has nothing, no effect on your insulin, none whatsoever. So I, I, one of my common morning um, uh, breakfasts is I'll make a cup of herbal tea and I'll put in a scoop of coconut oil or butter uh, and I just mix it up and I drink it. And I'm getting that fat, several hundred calories from pure fat, I'm loving it. It's fueling my body so my body has actual energy coming in and yet because it isn't spiking my insulin, I'm quite comfortable. The metabolically speaking, I'm gonna be just, gonna be running smoothly. Protein has a mild insulin effect, and there's a lot of context there, too. I'm not going to get into now for the sake of time, but there's a small insulin effect from protein. When you eat pure carbohydrate, insulin's going to go up about 10 times, if not more. That depends on the person. The more insulin resistant you are, the higher it will go, because you need more insulin to try to push that glucose out of the blood, right? And the longer it will stay high, Another way I could have shown this is a time course. If someone is exquisitely insulin sensitive, they could eat that bun from the hot dog. Mm -hmm. Not the hot dog, not the dog, or the, the dog itself is just these two things, which is why when I go indulge, I'm gonna just get two or three dogs and just eat that with some vegetables. But, uh, I, but anyway, you hopefully enjoyed your life, I'm glad you did. If you eat just the bun, for example, let's say someone eats the bun, they're exquisitely insulin sensitive. Insulin comes up and down in about an hour. Nice and quick, nice and easy. Insulin works so well in their bodies. If they're insulin resistant, it'll come up and it'll stay elevated for up to four hours, driving insulin resistance and other things we'll talk about in a minute. Now, of course, not all carbohydrates are created equal, and that is an important idea. Not all carbohydrates are the same. A piece of bread will not have the same effect on your blood glucose as, say, broccoli 
or something like that. And so my takeaway and how I try to <coughs> adhere to these principles and what I would encourage you to do is to simply be mindful. Take a little time and look up, look online, look up what the glycemic load, not glycemic index, they're different things, but look up what the glycemic load is of some of the common carbohydrates you eat. Essentially, if it's a vegetable that grows above the ground, it's fine, no problem. Berries, no problem. And then the tropical fruits, like bananas, um, that's much more of a problem. And when it comes to fruits, don't drink them. Don't drink fruit juice, don't make smoothies. Um, if you're going to Jamba Juice, you may as well go get a blizzard from Dairy Queen. It'll taste better anyway. Uh, so just be smart about it. And of course, the more processed and the more packaged it is, all the more reason to avoid it because insulin is just going ever higher. In addition to whatever else they may be putting in, including linoleic acid that I mentioned a moment ago, the bad fat. All right, so that's the controlling carbs aspect. Pretty straightforward, just be smart about it. I'm not saying never eat them again, just be smart about it. One of my favorite indulgences is ice cream. I love ice cream. And I plan to, I plan for it. Usually, depending on how I'm doing um, with my diet, I'll indulge a few times a month, perhaps, and I get a pint of Ben and & Jerry's. And so there I will be on a Saturday night, call my wife, I'm at, I'm at Target or Smith's, Hey, sweetheart, what kind of ice cream do you want? And she'll say, I just want some of yours. And I'll say, ah, no. <laughs> I'm, I've been waiting two weeks for this. I'm eating this whole pint. I'll get you your own, and I'm going to eat half of yours, too. <laughs> Maybe not. I, I usually can't get beyond the pint. But my point, it, by all means, eat them. Uh, but be smart about it, because this is the stuff that is not essential and is driving <clears throat> insulin resistance. Now, the other two lumping together, because in nature, you, I am unaware of a natural source of protein that doesn't come with fat. Generally, the same goes with fat, although we have extracted the fat in some instances, and some of the fatty fruits. What are the fatty fruits that we can absolutely indulge in? Avocados, olives, coconuts, and then any animal fat. I, I support wholeheartedly. Now, we're back to this concept, linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is a very, very dangerous fat to eat. It is, I hate to use this word too liberally, I've already said it once, it is toxic in the body. It has no place at, to the levels that we've been eating it. And indeed, look at what is the most common single source of fat in our diet, it is soybean oil. You can see it went from nothing, nothing, until the mid, you know, 1950s or so, suddenly came to, came to life, and now it is the single most commonly consumed fat. We're eating less fat from beef, from pork, uh, well, the animal fats, uh, poultry, uh, poultry, actually chickens, uh, chicken went from nothing. We used to only have chickens for their eggs. Now we eat them. I would say stick with the eggs, frankly. Egg, an egg, I consider an egg one of God's most perfectly packaged foods. And I eat dozens a week myself. So anyway, my point, the single most common source of fat in our diet is soybean oil. Soybean oil is enriched with linoleic acid, this toxic fat that we're eating. One of the reasons it's, it's toxic is really expressed very well in this graph. It is an ugly, busy graph, and you guys have no hope of seeing it at the back. Basically, it's looking at the degree to which these fats create things called polar compounds. In other words, dangerous molecules that damage the body. That's essentially what's the same. The more, here's the gist of it, the more saturated the fat is, the more stable it is. In fact, once upon a time, in movie theaters, when they were making popcorn, they used coconut oil, which is the most stable of all the fats, because it's so saturated, nothing happens to it, unless you get it to just ridiculously, ridiculously high temperatures. In contrast, seed oils, when you open that little bottle, like this, a little seed oil, like sunflower oil, or so-called vegetable oil, it's not vegetable at all, it's seeds, it becomes oxidized, or starts making polar compounds just at room temperature. It doesn't need any stimulus. In fact, it goes rancid so quickly they have to add deodorizers in order to keep it smelling pleasant. This is horrific stuff, and we have some very massive human studies to show if you have humans start eating less saturated fat, Time you've been told to avoid, I'm telling you not to. Uh, if you eat less saturated fat and you're replacing that with these seed oils, these polyunsaturated fats, you die more. 
the, the Sydney Heart Study, the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, were two of the biggest studies ever done, and they established that fact. All right, so here are the common seed oils, this little lake acid. Happy to talk about that more if we need to. Um, more evidence, people were afraid of LDL cholesterol. This study finds simply that if you're afraid of LDL cholesterol, all the more reason to be afraid of linoleic acid, because the linoleic acid that you eat becomes enriched in that LDL cholesterol particle, and that becomes oxidized, and as it becomes oxidized, it promotes plaque formation in the blood vessels. You just can't get that same phenomenon of a saturated fat. It doesn't get oxidized in the body. All right, so I am presenting something that might be a little uncomfortable <coughs> to some of you, telling you that I, in fact, believe animal protein and animal fat is among the best stuff on the planet for the human body. I am struck by this epistle from Paul to Timothy. When Paul was um, prophesying about our, our, the latter days, he says, in the latter days, um, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits in doctrine of devils. A little more, he says, forbidding to marry, so saying don't marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I do mean this with humility. I believe I know some of the truth of how the human body works. And I do mean that. Some of the actual reality of how the human body works. And I believe meat is among the healthiest stuff on the planet. And it was Paul prophesying so accurately that a sign of the time will be some of these disbelievers telling people not to eat meat. All right, now what happens if we compare these two kinds of diets head to head? A low fat, low calorie diet versus a low carbohydrate diet, restricting the one macronutrient that the body's having a hard time with in these disease states. Here's just a study to show that when you take full blown type 2 diabetics, which is insulin resistance at its core, just the glucose is now starting to spike. If you put them on a low carbohydrate diet, you know what happens? All they start doing is they have to start dropping their medications. Within a day, they have to change their medication dose because their glucose levels drop so quickly. And usually, this study goes on to show that they have to start dropping their anti-hyperglycemic medications. And then very quickly they have to start stopping, they have to stop taking their anti-hypertensive medications because their blood pressure drops so quickly as insulin comes down. Now I'm not telling you to stop any medication, but that's a conversation to have with your doctor. This was a study that looked at patients, type 2 diabetics for one year, had them adhere to a low fat, low calorie diet, conventional kind of diet, or a low carbohydrate, calorie unrestricted diet. Guess who did better? The low carb, calorie unrestricted. Same kind of thing. A low carbohydrate diet, eat as many calories as you want, or a low fat diet, count your calories, and do that by cutting fat. And if you look at the glucose and the insulin, insulin dropped three times more in the low carbohydrate group than in the low fat group. And glucose dropped by, I don't know, probably 10 times more. This was a very big study published about 10 years ago. They put people into three groups. A low-fat diet, low-fat, low-calorie, uh, a Mediterranean diet, so higher fat, lower carbohydrate, a low-calorie, so once again, count your calories, and then they had a calorie unrestricted group, eat as many calories as you want, just watch your carbs. What they had them do, what's so interesting and frustrating for me as a scientist, they had them start by eating 20 grams of carbohydrate per day. But they lost so much weight so quickly that they bumped it up by six times and had them actually go to 120 grams per day, which is much, much higher. That's actually really quite easy to do. But that's kind of frustrating for me. I wish they would have just said, stay at the 20 grams. Who cares if you're losing a lot of weight? Is that so bad? No, I would say it's not. Now, one takeaway from this, just for the sake of time, in every instance, measuring inflammation, measuring hormones that are indicative of healthy metabolic function, or measuring glucose and insulin, the worst diet every time was the low-fat, low-calorie diet. That was the worst diet in every single metric, including weight loss, which I didn't show and I should have. The worst one every time was the low-fat, low-calorie diet. So why on earth do we continue to just spout that same nonsense? 
Everyone does. You want to get metabolically healthy? You want to lose weight, lower your blood pressure? Everyone always says you got to eat less, exercise more. In fact, let me just go on a brief tangent. Let's just pretend for one moment I'm inviting all of you to my home for a buffet. It is the world's most famous chefs producing the most delicious food in the world, and I want you to eat as much as you can. I bet you would do two things to come as hungry as possible. I bet in the preceding days you would eat less, and I bet in the preceding days you would start exercising more. And indeed, you would come to my home, to my buffet, extremely hungry. Can you see the problem? That is the perfect recipe to ensure you're as hungry as possible, eat less, exercise more, and it's also the same nonsense that we've been saying for decades on how to lose weight. Yep, you will lose weight, and then you will give up because you can't sustain it because you just get so bloody hungry, and you gain it all back. It's not going to work. Um, we here in Utah Valley have shown, I just submitted this paper for publication actually, we took 11 type 2 diabetics, so these were women, middle-aged women, all one of them, all of them, that had just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And that diagnosis was based on something called their hemoglobin A1C. Have you guys heard of that before? Or this percent, the percent of red blood cells that have glucose stuck to it. And it's, it's meant to be an indication of how high glucose levels are. But basically, within 90 days, without taking a single drug, their diabetes was gone. Their HbA1c went from a diabetic level of above 8 to a non-diabetic level below 6%. The diabetes was gone. There's not a drug on the planet, not one <coughs> drug on the planet, that has that same effect. So this was right here in Utah Valley. Now, let's look at what insulin resistance does to these four. I could have picked any one of those disorders that I had around here. I don't have time to do that, of course. Let's just pick maybe the four most popular, or fear, in a way. Body fat, heart disease, cancer, and dementia. With body fat, what I can't overemphasize is the relevance of insulin in controlling fat cells. Let me not, sorry. So, in order for a fat cell to get big, insulin must be elevated. In order for a fat cell to shrink, insulin must be low. Insulin is the gatekeeper to the fat cells. Their growth or their um, shrinking. Insulin controls it entirely. One interesting thing, the first, as far as I know, the first clinical study ever done looking at low carb versus low fat diets and body fat was um, done um, in Daniel. You guys remember the story where Daniel's saying, we won't eat the king's meat, just give us this grain and seeds to eat and water and we're going to be healthier. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer, so prettier, and fatter in flesh. So they were fatter than the group eating the king's meat. This is the first published clinical study ever. <laughs> I mean, we can laugh about it, but can you at least kind of nod your heads? That's kind of cool. They were fatter because they were eating the grain and the seeds more than the group eating the meat. Of course, I don't think they were eating the meat for any other reason, and it just wasn't kosher. Nevertheless, this idea that insulin promotes body fat is not new. The very first dieting book ever published on the planet was the same kind of, before we even knew what insulin was, before we even knew the hormone insulin existed, this letter on corpulence from William Banting um, was telling people to avoid beer, bread, potatoes, these insulin spiking foods. And anyway, more people throughout time. Type 1 diabetes is an interesting example of this. You'll know, in type 1 diabetes, what does the diabetic not have in their, what's their body not making? Mm -hmm. They're not making insulin. They have to give themselves insulin in order to live. They have to. If, if they don't, they will die. Now, we also tell type 1 diabetics to rotate their injection sites. Are you familiar with that concept? When the type 1 diabetic is first leaving a doctor's office with their first prescription of insulin, the doctor will tell them repeatedly, rotate your sites. Some injections in the leg, some injections in the arm. For women, maybe on the side of the chest or anyone in the butt or the sides, or anywhere you have fat, inject yourself, but rotate it. This is what happens if you don't rotate your injection sites. In this woman with type 1 diabetes, we're looking at her groin area, her upper thighs. See these big pads, these big bumps, they're not tumors. She's been giving all of her insulin in these two spots. 
Look at this guy. He's been giving all of his insulin in these two spots flanking his belly button. Can you see how bizarre this is? He is so lean. You can see that line on his abdomen. You can see some definition in his chest. This is not a man who is obese. But look at how exaggerated all these fat cells are. Because all that insulin is telling those fat cells to grow. The, half, the same thing happens in the whole body of a type 1 diabetic. Here's Elizabeth Hughes, the very first type 1 diabetic in the U.S. to be treated with insulin. I say in the U.S. because that's Canada's one claim to fame, my, my native land. There are not a lot of, not a lot of claims to fame up in Canada. Um, she, here she is before insulin. Here she is within just a few months. Perfectly normal. But the big difference, she has now a nice, healthy amount of body fat. Interestingly, you can't see this is too small, you guys. Two things happen. When the type 1 diabetic goes from this, wasting away, the metabolic rate that is several hundred calories higher per day than it should be, two things happen. They start to get fat, and they start to eat less. Can you see the problem? They're eating less. The actual amount of calories coming in goes down, and now they're getting fat or gaining fat. I shouldn't say getting fat. They're gaining. Their body can actually hold on to some of that energy now. This phenomenon that insulin shots in a type 1 diabetic control how fat the type 1 diabetic is, is so well known among type 1 diabetics that it causes some to develop an eating disorder called diabolemia. When they will deliberately underdose their insulin injections to stay skinny. And it is a horrific disease, mentally and physically. It kills the body. The same thing happens in type 2 diabetics. When you start giving a type 2 diabetic insulin, they start eating less and they start getting fed. For the sake of time, I'm just going to skip over that. In fact, I want to already be taking questions now, so I'm going to... Heart disease, heart disease is insulin resistance. When you put people on a low-carbohydrate diet, their blood lipids generally get better. Triglycerides plummet. HDL cholesterol goes up. The small, dense LDL, sometimes called LDL pattern B, which is the type of LDL that matters, it gets better, it goes down. Anyway, more of the same. Cancer, I wanna leave you with this idea that cancer isn't caused by insulin resistance. But the two most common cancers, breast and prostate cancer, if you actually take a biopsy of the tumor in the breast, it will have up to seven times more insulin receptors. It is basically allowing the insulin to tell it to grow faster. The same thing with prostate tumor. And men and women that are the most insulin resistant, even if they're not obese, have the highest risk of cancer mortality. And that is generally because of this idea that when you have a cancer cell, if there's too much insulin in the blood, insulin tells the cancer cell to grow. If there's too much glucose in the blood, well, glucose is the only fuel a cancer cell can use. It can't use fat for fuel. It doesn't use amino acids for fuel, nothing does. It doesn't use ketones, something I haven't mentioned at all, and I'm not going to again. It doesn't use them, it can only use glucose. So in the insulin resistant or diabetic state, we are telling the cancer cells to grow, and we're giving them more of the very fuel they need for that growth. And so of course the cancer cells just loving you. <laughs> and if you give a type two diabetic insulin, a type two diabetic, remember type two diabetic already has high levels of insulin. If you give them even more insulin, their risk of dying from cancer goes up by 90%. It almost doubles. So if you know a type 2 diabetic that is on insulin, ask them to talk with their physician very, very quickly. I'm not telling, I'm not giving any prescription at all, but giving a type 2 diabetic insulin is giving them more of the very thing that's killing them. Generally, the same is going with dementia. Um, basically, with Alzheimer's disease, it is insulin resistance of the brain. Um, that's why we more and more call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. It is insulin resistance of the brain. And this study that took 10 people with early stage Alzheimer's disease, and all of which, all of whom had had a, a reduction in their life, their quality of life, several of these 10 subjects had, had to quit their jobs because their dementia had gotten so bad. Um, the, they, were, uh, they were able to go back to work. Every one of them, all 10, reported improvements, sustained improvements. And one of the key things was lowering the insulin, um, feeding the brain ketones, but that's another topic, but basically improving the insulin sensitivity. Now, in closing, I hope you can appreciate 
why someone like me would devote his whole career to studying something as seemingly obscure as insulin resistance. It is the most common disorder in the world. Statistically, 65% of us in this room have it, and it will drive every chronic disease, what I commonly refer to as the plagues of prosperity. The common core with all of them is insulin resistance. Now, with the remaining time, I would love to answer any questions. Thanks for listening. So, what is the effect of uh, of diet soda pop on insulin levels? Diet soda. Yeah. And diet soda does nothing. So I can. No worries. No worries. Yeah. So the, the sweetener, the sweetener in diet soda is aspartame, and aspartame does not affect insulin at all. Um, other some sweeteners do. Uh, xylitol does a little bit. Maltitol, mannitol do. In addition to giving you wicked gut gas and diarrhea as well if you have too much. Um, but stevia, erythritol, um, monk fruit, sweetener, aspartame, no effect. What about the caffeine? Caffeine is no effect. Yeah. Grant, the candy's wife. Are say, say that again. I'm not saying they're good for you. I'm not saying they're good for you. What I'm saying, it will not increase your insulin. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Am I being clear? It yeah. will not increase your insulin. Matt, me. Go ahead. You said bananas were not good. So, can you, well, can you briefly explain? I mean, I believe yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you just have to look at how much sugar is in the fruit. Knowing that that fructose, which is what's sweet, most of which, much of it will be converted to glucose, and that's then going to spike insulin. So bananas is just one of the most sugary of all the fruits. And that's generally true of the tropical fruits. Bananas, mangoes, um, pineapples, those are ones to be very careful with. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I make a smoothie in the morning. A smoothie in the morning, yeah. With vegetables and I throw some strawberries in there. Yep, yeah. You say it's a What's the difference between that and the smoothie? Yeah, so I need to be kind of careful because I've never seen a study that has compared that. Now, mind you, a smoothie is different from a juice because you have kept the fiber there. You've just sheared it with those blades. Those blenders that cost as much as a small car. Um, uh, and they're amazing. Uh, but I can't speak to what, how much your insulin will go up. But I am going to speculate with a high degree of confidence that it will have a higher insulin effect than otherwise. But berries, when it comes to fruits, berries are on the green light list. They're the good one. I meant to bring in a handout. I'm so sorry. Who did I? Someone, one of the physical facility guys asked me to bring a handout. I was going to send something to Tim, and Tim was going to print it out for me. I was going to tell him to print it out, but I just forgot. Still I still could, still like all, because I see Tim all the time in all sorts of semi-dressed situations. <laughs> yeah. So you go to the doctor, and you ask him for your blood test on insulin. Yeah, please said, measure my insulin. And he says, it's up. Is there, is there medication or is it just diet? Oh, there is medication. The most effective medication is metformin, also known as glucophage. Have you guys heard of that one? Any diabetic in the room will have heard of it, or if you have a spouse who has it. But as effective as metformin is, lifestyle changes are twice, and I mean that, I'm, there's an actual study I'm citing right now, lifestyle changes are over twice as effective. And I was submitted, they're actually doing lifestyle changes right, like with those three pillars in mind, then it's going to be orders of magnitude more effective. Saturated fats are bacon and sausage, red meats. Saturated fats are the fats I mentioned earlier. Animal fat, which is a mix. In fact, depending on the pork, depending on the lard, it will have as much monounsaturated fat as it does saturated, just like almonds. So animal fat is never completely saturated. It's a mix of saturated and unsaturated. The most saturated fat is coconut oil. But I even still say, who cares? But bacon, and what I'm saying is, you say animal fat. So I'm saying. I, yeah. I've got a heart doctor. My family has heart issues. He is, and I know you hear this all the time. He has told me, he's the exact opposite of what he told me. He's been practicing for a long time. Yeah. Uh, he, it sounds to me like he bought into what everybody else has bought into in the last. So he's telling me, being your cholesterol is getting too high, you need to stop eating bacon and red meat. 
Yeah, so if you want to look well, at how it, do I... well, so there's a few, a few points there with regards to cholesterol. First of all, look at the markers that matter. And the one that matters the most is look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. Really, at the risk of seeming controversial, the LDL is, is this isn't controversial. It is a terrible predictor of who's going to die from a heart attack. When you look at who's actually coming to an emergency room, this is a study from UCLA, with who's just had a heart attack. And you look at their LDL, there are just as many people with high LDL levels as there are low. LDL is a terrible predictor. In contrast, if you start looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio, triglycerides divided by HDL, now you're cooking with gas. And if that number is below 1.5, you are doing great, generally speaking. So, when your doctor says your cholesterol is getting too high, your counter could be, so what? People who have high cholesterol have a reduced risk of dementia. People who have high cholesterol live longer. People who have high cholesterol have a reduced risk of cancer. They have a reduced risk of sepsis, which is a severe infection. I'm just telling you. Well, I know what he's saying. I'm giving, you, I'm giving you your reply. <laughs> I'm not making this up. If you look at the oldest of the old, the higher the cholesterol, the longer they're going to live. And the moment you start pushing cholesterol down, depression goes up, suicide risk goes up, fertility in men goes down, the sperm count and sperm quality goes down. That's why I often joke that if you're a man and you're a vegan, it's a self-correcting problem because you're never going to have offspring. <laughs> the veganism will die with you. Well, many are. So this study that I showed you earlier, my data from here, it's because there are a handful of physicians with Revere that do this. At the moment a diabetic patient comes in, hypertensive, diabetic, hypercholesterolemia, immediately they say you've got drugs in your future or we can change your diet. And we're going to do it with a low carb diet. Yeah, please. My husband was diagnosed three years ago. He's been on your diet and he is not diabetic. And he's doing great. He is. He's, he's diabetes. reversed the diabetes. He's reversed the diabetes. Good for him. <coughs> and good for you for cheering for him. Yeah, good. That's good. That's excellent to hear. There you go. Right there. From the mouth of two minutes. Yes. When have you found that you know, from low carb, do men tend to lose more weight than women? Men always. And if so, why? Yeah, yeah, so that's a big kind of loaded question. Um, but men always lose more weight than women. It, you, it doesn't matter what you do. You can say, all right, your diet is going to be staring at a wall for an hour. The man's going to lose more weight. <laughs> um, there are some reasons for that. One, at the risk of this sounding like a cop-out, women need more fat than men for normal physiological function. And let's look at fertility, which you could say is any organism's greatest reason to be healthy. It is to have offspring. Man, a man can have a body fat level down like 2%. Even me, maybe lower, and still be perfectly fertile. He has perfect fertility all the way, because he doesn't have to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> right? A woman, if she, gets, if she gets down to 10% body fat, nope, she's infertile. She stopped menstruating. You must, and the female in particular, that body fat tells the brain through a hormone called leptin. I bet most of you have heard of that hormone before. Leptin tells the brain, hey, there's enough fat on my body to ovulate. Then the leptin will come back to the ovaries through different hormones and tell the ovaries, hey, time to ovulate, essentially. That's why nowadays, as we have little girls and boys, but more little girls, being fatter, younger, what's happening with their puberty, it's starting earlier. We've been shifting, we've been pushing earlier, earlier. Every generation, they're going through puberty earlier than the last generation. Now, if it's too early, it's called precocious puberty, and almost always it's because she has too much fat, that too much fat is re releasing too much leptin, leptin is then going to the brain and basically giving the brain this false sense of fertility. So, back to your question, I'm sorry for the tangent. Women need more fat than men, and the woman's body will defend the fat more than the man's body. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so if you're going to try to adhere to a low... Yeah, so if you're trying to eat a low-carbohydrate diet, what kind of percentages of macronutrients are you looking at? With this concept in mind, when it comes to... First of all, I, I, I almost hate kind of giving that because I do not believe there is a perfect formula. I would say, firstly, just be smart about your carbs. 
and I never count calories, and I, I emphasize that's a tedious way to live. But typically, it's going to be around 15 to 5 percent of calories from carbohydrates, depending on the person. And if you were answering yes to two or more of that little quiz, you got to be on the lower end. If you're answering no to all of them, man, you can fudge it. I answer no to every one of those things. I want to stay lean because I lost my hair 20 years ago, and I have a little bit of ego left. And I figure I want to control whatever I can control. <laughs> and I'm terrified of cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Terrified of them both. Having seen that, those both pop up in my family. So I want to keep my insulin in control, and I want to keep my glucose in control. So that's how, now I, because however I'm metabolically healthy and active, um, I got a little more wiggle room. And many of you do too. It's not just me, of course. Um, but the more we're pushing that quiz, and the more you have to scrutinize your carbohydrates because yours is a body, whoever that is, that does not tolerate carbohydrates very well. So I can't give a specific percent, but I would say, in addition to just being very careful with your carbohydrates, being smart about it, prioritize your protein, especially as we get older. We need more protein as we age in order to tell the muscles that they can grow. It becomes harder for the body to do that. We have to give it a bigger stimulus with dietary protein. But of course, the best stimulus is resistance exercise. No amount of dietary protein is going to make up for you just being a schlub and watching a Wheel of Fortune all day. What kind of protein? Like, like Animal protein is the yeah. best. How do you do, you do like protein powder? Yeah, you can. Uh, me personally, I, I kind of hate to make it me personally, but yes, I do sometimes use powdered whey protein. Um, unsweetened, totally unflavored everything, just pure whey from grass-fed cow. I buy a huge, like, 10-pound bin from Amazon, and I will, depending on the day, depending on where I'm going, I will make a little shake with some whey and some flavor and a little sweetener and some raw eggs, and I eat a lot of eggs, and I drink raw eggs all the time. Your risk of getting salmonella is higher from eating kale and spinach than it is from eating a raw egg. And I like to eat kale and spinach indirectly. I want the cow that I eat to eat kale. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> but there is kind of a serious side. My comment there about the Apostle Paul prophesying our latter days and the popularity of veganism and anti-meat, I look across campus and I see kids wearing these shirts that it's like it's meant to look like Yale. First of all, I d despise any time seeing a student wearing a t-shirt or a hat for another university. My sentiment is if you're a fan of the University of Oregon so much, then get the hell out of here. <laughs> anyway, anyway. Uh, um, but so they have a my point, sorry. They have a t-shirt that looks like Yale University, but it says Kale. And I look at that poor little vegan. Um, and I, I, I ache for the person. Um, I have had usually young women in my class come up to me and apologize. Almost every semester this will happen. Dr. Bickler, I'm sorry I'm falling asleep um, all the time. And I say, I don't care. You're paying or your parents are paying for your tuition. You obviously don't care. Fall asleep. Um, and I don't care. Uh, but, but I care about the student. And I'll ask, why are you falling asleep? Well, my, my iron dose isn't quite right. The moment I hear that, my iron dose isn't quite right, so I feel fatigued and lethargic. I know immediately what's going on. They're not eating meat. So they have to take an iron supplement. And I ache for these young women, I genuinely do, as irreverent as I sometimes am, I mean all reverence here, I ache for these young vegans who are ruining their bodies, because they are. It is not something that is conducive to living a healthy life which is why children cannot thrive when they're fed a vegan diet, which is why the body starts to degrade, um, because it is deficient. They have focused on the one macronutrient that is not essential to human survival. And so the, the privilege of veganism, it is a privilege of the elite. You have to be educated enough to know what you're deficient in, and you have to be able to afford the supplements to make up for it. Imagine the, the hubris, the ego, and going to someone in a third world country and telling them, you need to eat vegan. They're going to die. They can't do it. They don't know what they're going to be deficient in, and they can't afford the supplements. So it is these privileged, egotistical Westerners who believe that is the best way to do it. No, come on. Give me a break.
Now, it's, now, I don't mean to say it's not important to respect the life of the animal that we're eating. I believe, in fact, it is essential. And when we offer a prayer over the food that we eat, if an animal died, I think we ought to be mindful of that sacrifice and be profoundly grateful. But even if we're eating vegetables, something must die for something to live. Plants are no exception. The best way to make plants grow, give them pieces of an animal. Give them the blood, give them the bone of an animal, and they'll grow like weeds. Something must die. Anyway. Yeah, uh, please, the girl in the black, in the back. You. Yeah, please, either of you too. Oh, okay. Well, I'm wondering, so I'm, I'm a student right now, and so I kind of, I've recognized, like, recently I tried to change my diet and exercise more, and I totally, like, feel what you're saying is true just from experience. I feel, for me, it's a challenge of balancing, uh, like, time I have with, with making money and school and then having enough money to buy the berries. Yeah. And so, like, is there a resource or a suggestion you have for people that are on the, like, a lower budget? Yeah. That's a great question. It's hard because bread, bread, potatoes, yep. it's, it's all very cheap. Yep. I know, but, but I will say, so I appreciate your point. I really do. I've had students that have done this to tremendous health benefits and found just what you're saying. Usually what they focus on is they'll look for sales on meat, like close out meat. Um, eggs are dirt cheap. And again, I do consider the egg the most perfectly packaged food. You think about it, this has everything for life. Eat it or drink it, whatever. I add it to all my shakes all the time and it makes them so good. So there are ways to do it, and I, I think that there are, in fact, books like Keto Cheap or Low Carb on the Cheap that you could probably find on Amazon. But I, with regards to eggs, though, just a funny little story. I will often, depending on breakfast, I'll often offer to make my wife a breakfast shake. She'll always take me up on it. You bet. They're delicious. Make me a shake. Thank you. Um, I make a shake. One time she saw me cracking the eggs into the blender. <laughs> she said, oh, no, I'm not drinking that. I said, I always do this. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not drinking. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm not doing it. So I thought, all right, fine. I'll have this one. I'll make you your own without the egg. She drank it. She said, okay. I just don't want to see in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like Rocky. I hear I have the tiger every time I'm drinking that stuff. <laughs> all right, we've gone over the hour, and I didn't intend to. Um, if you guys have some burden, listen, last question. Just one question. Is this the information on your website? No, I, 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 I kind of have a website, but I kind of don't. I, I've not really been smart about it. Um, I've been a little too altruistic. Um, uh, yeah, it is. I, I do have a website, and I can say this because I make no money from it at all, so please don't think I have an ulterior motive. A few colleagues and I, including one of these physicians from Revere, we started a website called InsulinIQ.com. It's poorly serviced, but it does, in fact, it might have the food guide that I was going to email Tim. Okay. It might be on there. So you can check that out, insuliniq.com. The intention of that is and was, is kind of, to help people be aware of insulin. And a lot of this concept is, is on there. Guys, thanks for listening. I really had a great time. Thanks for listening.